So let's talk about other developments in the world of oil and gas. I'm being joined on the program by Ibrahim Babalola, who's an investment analyst with Afri Invest. Uh, good morning to you, Ibrahim. Thank you so much for joining us on the program. Good morning, Harris. So one of the biggest issues in the news right now is, uh, well, it's been in the news for quite some time, but it's trending again, is uh, the story around uh, the NATI report on the NNPC and its subsidiary, the NPDC. What do you make of this report? I think the, the report covers you know, some of the challenges in, in, in the sector, particularly with um, remittances by, by the NMPC and, and, and its subsidiaries. Uh, the NIT is claiming that um, the NMPC is owing, through the NMPDC of course, is owing or um, has um, outstanding remittances of, of over $20 billion, billion that hasn't been remitted into the Fed, Fed, Federation accounts, you know, and, and of course that's, that's a lot of money. Um, so. The report is, you know, um, highlighting that one, and then also the under undervaluation of some of the um, all, all mining licenses that were transferred from the NMPC to the to the to the N, to the M, M, MPDC. I think one of the examples was um, the Shell joint venture, which was valued at 1.8 billion dollars uh, when when the transfer was 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 done, and um, PwC valued um, the same asset at over 3.4 billion dollars so there's a bit of disparity within the valuation so the um, the NAT is recommending that the federal government should you know first and foremost try to recover the outstanding remittances from from NMPC and NPDC and sort of use it to fund um, the economic re recovery and um, there's been public hearings on you know on that so mm -hmm. I know that very recently the House of Representatives actually at a committee actually you know talked about this and asked the NMPC to come and brief it on mm -hmm. on this um, discrepancies between the balancing of the, you know the monies and it's, it's supposed to come uh, span between 2011 and 2014 so just it, it just seems as if there's so many reports out there in the open mm. but how quickly do you think that um, something will be done in terms of either punishing or getting them to return these monies to government coffers if, if they're sitting anywhere well, I, I think you know the NMPC has to come and sort of say side of the story and say, okay, this is the present um, present reality and this is this is what um, what's actually go go going on. But uh, for for recoveries or punishments, this administration is a very serious administration. You know, particularly with sort of revamping and re over overhauling some of um, some of these agencies, particularly the NMPC and oil oil and gas sector itself. So, uh, well, we in in the short term, I, I believe that in the short term, the NMPC would probably issue a statement on 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 the remittances and 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 the value and the valuations of 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 these these assets uh, in in the short term. Of course, uh, our 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 position has always been for the government to sort of. Um, sell off some of his stake in, in, the, in, in the JVs or list them on the exchange, which would, of course, improve gov um, corporate governance of, 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 of these of this, um, joint venture agreements, of course. Mm. But then beyond the issue of unremitted monies, there mm -hmm. are issues of transparency and, mm -hmm. and efficiency with the operations of the MPDC, for mm -hmm. instance. Now, what are your thoughts on this? I, I think it goes beyond the MPDC, you know. It's probably the, 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 the NMPC. But as Nate has said, there's been improvements over the last over the last couple of years. You know, the President's Petroleum um, Minister of State for Petroleum has come and over overhauled the NMPC. You know, created new subsidiaries to try to sort of micromanage um, these agencies. You know, but but that that said, you can't take away the fact that there's um, sort of been a lot of. Um, a lot of um, lack of accountability in the operations of the NMPC. The NMPC has always been the target when people are talking about uh, government agency that lacks um, accountability. But there's been improvements over the last couple of years, and I'm sure we'll continue to see improvements in, in the operations of the NMPC and the subsidiaries. Let's talk a little bit of a global now. Oil prices mm -hmm. have been above $50 per barrel for some time. Mm -hmm. How soon do you think uh, the shale threat, which seems to be um, looming in everybody's faces, will be, you know, will maybe crystallize do you think we should begin to worry about it should we begin to worry uh i think the answer to that question would be what happens uh in what happens on may 25 right so the opec will be meeting to to discuss um the renewal of the oil oil freeze agreements the, you know the oil freeze agreement has a six month term which would expire in in june, in june. so the meeting in may a uh, meeting in may i think on may 25 to discuss to discuss this if for any reason, they're not able to extend the tenure of this agreement, then we may begin to worry. You know, the U.S. continues to pump up its shale production. You know, we're discussing it um, 
year on year at the end of March, um, show, the drilling rigs for shale production has in, had increased by over 300, 300 units to so over 800 units in the U.S. You know, that's to sort of show the seriousness with which the U.S. is going to pump up shale production. And you also have shale production from Canada, from Canada as well. The, the problem, you know, some of the bottlenecks in the renewal of this um, agreement uh, might be from the non-OPEC members, particularly, particularly Russia. Why? As we reports recently that Russia has been meeting with local oil companies in Russia, you know, to sort of discuss if it should renew, if it should renew um, its its position in the oil in the oil agreement. Russia Russia was supposed to cut about 300,000 barrels per day, but from from data from available data, Russia is only cutting about 130,000 barrels per day. And when you look at this historically, this when this type of agreements have actually when they tried to have this type of agreement I think in 2000, uh, when Russia was supposed to cut with, along with Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia went ahead to cut. Russia didn't cut. So I think it's the first time that Russia is actually cutting. Yes, yeah, it seems Russia as if everybody is, you know, actually production. agreeing and abiding mm -hmm. by that production cut, uh, um, you know, given by by OPEC. But if, for instance, mm -hmm. at its May meeting, it is decided that uh, they're going to continue with the freeze production, particularly for, you know, Nigeria was exempt, as well as I Iran mm -hmm. and, and, um, and I think Libya, Libya yeah. the third country, yes. So if it goes ahead and says, okay, so we continue with this uh, production freeze, how do you think the market is going to react? I, I think oil prices will remain, will remain stable uh, above the, the $50 per barrel. As long as long as the you know the freeze agreement is extended, OPEX oil exports accounts for about 60% of total petroleum traded you know globally. So OPEC actually has uh, a, a significant market market share when you look at the the global um, oil traded, of course. Uh, Again, fingers crossed on the extension extension of the tenure and the agreements by, by all parties, you know. They might decide to look at um, Nigeria and say, okay, um, the military in Nigeria that has sort of subsided a, a little bit. Maybe we shouldn't exempt you guys uh, anymore. So these, these, are the, these are the key issues that may lead to some disagreements. And, on, and do you think that at any time none of these countries are going to challenge, uh, uh, you know, what OPEC stands for and say, hey, OPEC, uh, we, we really do not want you to be lord and master over and determine what it is that we're supposed to be putting on the table would rather do it on our own. Do you think at any time OPEC might begin to lose the kind of hold it has on some of the non-OPEC um, countries, for instance? Uh, well, for, for the OPEC members, you know, it's not, it's not like there's a dictatorship. They all have to come together and sit but and, then, <laughs> and sometimes, discuss. And sometimes discuss they're, sitting, they're sitting together on the table and some people prefer to eat rice, some people prefer to eat beans, and some people prefer not to even sit at the table at all. Because, some, issues like because that. some people have greater market share than some people. Of course, if you have a larger market share, you probably have a louder voice. For the non-OPEC members, you know, OPEC doesn't necessarily have a hold, hold on them, but um, a higher oil price would benefit, would benefit all, 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 all parties, um, OPEC and non-OPEC members. So freezing, continuing the freeze agreement will be beneficial for the market, particularly when you think about the increased shale production by, by the U.S. But in the very short term, what's your outlook for the oil market? We're seeing oil prices hovering between 56, 55, $54 per barrel. And even though with a th even with the threat mm -hmm. of having more oil rigs from the U.S. coming up in terms of shale production, it still looks like the market is going to remain bullish at least for now. Well, I mean, it's, it's been because the thing because of the, the supply cuts when um, Saudi Arabia and Iran, you know, all these all these big players haven't um, necessarily been even pumping up up to the agreed. Um, they allowed they allowed quota you know they're not even doing up to what they're supposed to, what they're allowed to do so so we have a bit of um a bit of reduced reduced supply which is you know helping helping the prices in in the market of course uh on the shorter term i, I think that you know may may is a bit of a short term we're already in april so the decisions are that at that meeting would, this, would determine the, the direction of all prices on the short term. Ibrahim Babalola, investment analyst with AfriInvest, thank you so much for your perspectives this morning. Thank you, Harry, for having me. Business Morning continues after now. Stay with us.